Okay, so we're back now with uh, modern urban locations. And the, in the textbook, they give you this picture of uh, Mont Saint Michel. Uh, this is a monastery for Saint Michael, uh, one of the angels of the Bible. Um, but take a look at the location of this off the coast of France and to know that the causeway that's there, uh, this is somewhat of a tombolo, a, ge a geologic feature. But there's many times, uh, especially with really high tides, where you can't access this uh, this area. So uh, it's easily defensible, uh, obviously. It's just a rock out in the middle of the ocean with the tidal basin around it, or the tidal flats, excuse me, around that. Um, and, you know, they, they have super, super tides, uh, what, like every 18 years as well, where you just can't get to it unless you have a boat. Um, but this is uh, certainly a monastery, uh, but there's shops all over this island. There are uh, hotels, and yeah, it's a big tourist destination. I was one of them who went, and so, you know, the, the textbook points out the armies of tourists, and there's a couple of the soldiers that attack. Those are my two daughters, so I thought I'd dump them in here. <laughs> but also, let's take a look at uh, not just the the place itself, but why a place is where it is. So if you look at Pittsburgh, for instance, uh, on the Allegheny and the Monongahela rivers, which come together to form the Golden Triangle, at that confluence of those two rivers, you have the Ohio. And so this is a very pivotal very pivotal place where you have easy river access, barge traffic, coal, iron ore, processed steel, steel city, heart of the industrial, you know, the industrial heartland of America. And you, know, you still have the Pittsburgh Steelers, you know, playing football every Sunday. Um, the bridge networks around here need to be extensive. Uh, so you've got over here on this side, the Three Sisters Bridges, which would be Clemente Bridge, Andy Warhol Bridge, and Rachel Carson. Uh, I've mentioned her Silent Spring before. Um, but they've had to revamp this town. I won't lie to you. I go up here fairly often because I like watching the games up here. Um, and... You know, now that they've torn down the foundries and the blast furnaces and the air's cleaned up, this is a really nice city now. It's very beautiful. Um, PNC Park, I go for baseball. Uh, the backdrops are just wonderful. Good pedestrian, good good air quality, uh, museums and all kinds of stuff here, guys. So if you get a chance to go up, you'll see a very different Pittsburgh than you would have um, in the 1970s. But again, that said, let's take a look at what, are the advantages of location and so this image i'm showing you here is uh, de la cité which is in paris and so this is on the seine river and so take a look i'm trying to find my cursor here we go this right here is notre dame you know it burned down just a few well, a couple three years ago um, and now they're rebuilding it but look at this wonderful uh, river island site fortification you could get to it by the bridges and there's there's a, a subway that runs under here but of course back before you know if you're wanting to protect this from say invaders or something then this is a great site to have a river meander site as you see on the left hand side a land peninsula site a sheltered harbor site all of these really stand out you know uh offshore island site uh like we saw with uh uh Mont Michel, and then take a look at the Acropolis site. So if you look here, the Acropolis in, in Athens, Greece, um, then uh, you, you see that it's on the top of this thing here. So here is the Parthenon, uh, and and so it really, you see the, the hatch marks here kind of showing you the, the steep-sided hill part of this feature, which makes it very difficult uh, to assail. And of course, if you build walls and then you can fortify around that too and give it one entry point, much like Masada was in the Bible and in, in modern Israel. But uh, these locations uh, are one of the prime reasons to, to locate a city. There are others, of course, military, uh, maybe universities, uh, you know, uh, there's several different, you know, reasons, but but by geographical placing, those hopefully explain it. So if we'll take a look at central place theory here, which is of Walter Kristaller, a German urban geographer, he wanted to look at a very uncomplicated place, uh, but to see if he could show predictive aspects of a model here. Now, it does not intend to to um, be an exact you know, 
predictor of, of what we would see in the real world. But, buddy, it's close. And if it weren't this good, we wouldn't be talking about it anyway. So, in essence, here's what he's doing. And, and look, I want to show you real quick. I have two other uh, graphics here that were left out of the textbook that might help explain a little bit better. But let's take a look at what Christaller thought you should have. Well, first, there's a hierarchy. So the hierarchy is, is that the first order city here in the center, and let's just call this Nashville, but this first order uh, is not going to have any other rival uh, city that's going to pop up near it, unless there's certain, you know, uh, geographic factors like uh, a river, like Minneapolis, St. Paul, or Dallas, Fort Worth, you might get that, but, you know, there's a, there's an intervening aspect associated with it all right on the outskirts here of this kind of hexagon you see the second tier cities so here 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 now these are cities that offer almost all the types of goods and services that you would find in the major city but not all of them so if we were to look in nashville all the best doctors all you know the the biggest sporting teams the predators the the titans the nashville sounds uh those kinds of things all the big concert venues uh i don't know if i just said restaurants but uh, when you start to look at these things no other place near it is going to rival it you would have to go to the southeast to atlanta or the south west to memphis or to the north to louisville or south to birmingham or northwest to st louis to kind of get these same kinds of top tier first order cities and so what's the range you would have to travel you know and what's the threshold for the thing that you're wanting to buy the service you're wanting to procure and so considering those things then this would be the layout so of all the big things I mentioned in Nashville, you can get almost all those things in those second tier cities like a Jackson, Tennessee, if you're going toward uh, uh, Memphis or in, say, Chattanooga on your way to Atlanta or maybe Bowling Green. It doesn't fall exactly equidistant between it and Louisville, but not bad. you got Western Kentucky University. You've got, you know, you've got the... Chicago, or excuse me, Chicago, uh, the Chattanooga Lookouts baseball team, uh, 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 Huntsville, Alabama is that midway point between there and, and Birmingham, and it has the Space and Rocket Center. So if you look at these these second tier cities, and then you keep going on down to say your Gallatins and, and all the way down, uh, by the time you get to the local level, you're going to find out that uh, you're not really willing to travel that far to buy, um, I don't know, shampoo and fried chicken or whatever it happens to be that you want but for for the things that you'll travel the lar longest way for those are those big ticket items it's going to be to that uh that that prime city in the center and so what we see here coming next is that once you start to draw the lines and connect the hexagons that this network of for instance, let's take a look at this. So when you see a city like this, isn't it often that you see a loop road that goes around it, like a Briley Parkway or like an 840, the southern loop around Nashville? And the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, and so this this network connecting all these towns and cities here is pretty predictive by his model. And then if you look at this part right here, uh, when they start to bring in transportation, uh, think about Nashville being exactly what you see it here, 65 interstate, 65 north and south. Now this doesn't match up exactly right, but let's say this is our uh, east-west of interstate 40. And then this one is kind of uh, north northwest and southeast this is 24 interstate 24 which tells you why nashville is so very important in in uh, transportation and connectivity why automobile manufacturers moved here and why um why this is so regionally connected to the interior the heartland the midwest the old northwest uh the states like ohio and indiana and illinois uh very vitally important place in the scheme of things so again Christaller uh put this in you know out for us to kind of see how this makeup works and it does you know it does largely fit what we would find with some exceptions in the real world
Okay. All right. So seaports are the ones that tie uh, uh, this global economy together. And so containerized shipping uh, was put forth by a fellow named Malcolm McLean. And you can see this very clearly in this Hanjin uh I think Hanjin is a South Korean uh, transportation company, but then that all of the containers on there easily fit on the backs of trucks, on the backs of trains, and on the decks of these super cargo ships. And having these ports like Oakland, like Long Beach, like the Port of LA, like Seattle, like Miami, like New Orleans, although those aren't nearly as big as the West Coast cities because there's so much coming in from uh, Asia, obviously China and the, and the Asian realm and even India and other producers there. Um, these ports are vitally, you know, a vital cog in, in the global logistics and supply chain. And of course, with the pandemic and now all the, the rush on components, uh, you're, you're seeing kinks in that, in that cargo chain, if you will. And with that, you have rising costs on things like parts for cars, new and used cars, uh, all manner of things that have been disrupted by the pandemic and by uh, the lack of the system being able to work pr properly. Uh, but these big facilities here uh, are carrying gargantuan amounts of, I mean, just look at this one boat here. The amount of stuff that's on there is just unbelievable and so you've got these what used to be stevedores would load and unload these ships now you've got guys on cranes uh fully automated working 24 hours a day or at least multiple shifts i remember hearing this from president biden and trying to you know get more work but it's it's really not them that are behind it's just uh the system itself is is it's all fouled up it's gummed up right now and it's making it difficult all right talking still about cities though uh so ports we just got talked about uh, we just talked about so uh other important aspects are the rural to urban migration that you'd see in china 1.4 billion people guys and uh these were largely rural dwelling people in the time of mao i told you he died in 1976 but by the time 1978 rolls around you've got a new premier Deng xiaoping and he does two important things he he and enforces the one-child policy for the ethnic Han, the dominant group of China, and he turns to capitalism. Even though they're a communist government, they're a hyper-capitalist society now. So this made a, a real transition for especially young people from the interior coming to cities to work in factories. Uh, they would also look for things like uh, nightlife, activities to do, uh, maybe going to school, college, university, uh, all manner of things. So this, they talk about it in China as being a black population, and this is a, a population of people that are really on the move and hard to count to know where they are. Um, but this is a remarkable shift from rural to urban urban across this landscape. So this major influx of people into these cities is, of course, draining on resources. Where do you put them? Um, you should know the ghost cities of China. Lots of uh, apartments and, and different things have been built for these people, but a lot of people don't have the money to buy those things. So some of those uh, apartment complexes aren't being heavily utilized at this point. But having uh, 56 percent of the population in the cities by you know four more years having 240 cities of a population over a million you're talking about a Guang, Guangzhou for instance just incredible crush of people there's a discussion now about it being a hundred mile city and that is to say that it is the core with all these satellite cities being loaded up with people and uh where do you where do you fit them all? How do you how do you transport them? Where do, where do they where do they live? Where do they get green spaces? Uh, to to uh, where's the nightlife? Uh, same thing for Pudong and Shanghai right here. Same thing for Tianjin and uh, Beijing. These two are probably going to grow together over the next few decades, and the challenges that you will see in these cities will be paramount. But luckily, China's in, it, in its new infancy in building cities so they can use all the technology uh, and planning ahead of that crush a population they know it's going to come and so hopefully with fingers crossed um, there won't be that that many uh, insurmountable problems all right i'm going to pause it here and move on to the next phase see you in a second bye